This conference will now be recorded. Okay, um, so we actually, just for, for the sake of our audience, we actually have uh, three persons here from Jamaica. We, uh, that's Brother Howard, uh, Brother Don, he's my brother uh, in another part of the island. There is Brother Ken, who is in Pennsylvania. There is Brother Vlad, who is joining us from Romania. And there are brothers Imad and Nada, who are joining us from Queensland, right? Queensland in Australia. So, uh, the topic we will be discussing this evening is, is, is focused on the character of God. And the, the title of the discussion is, Does God Kill? Now, we, we thought, we thought, and, and Sister Cheryl is just joining us, but if you can turn off your camera, Sister Cheryl, it would help the recording. Um, we thought that it would be a good idea to discuss this, the question of does God kill? Because our, our camp meeting theme is the character of God. And um, for many years, those who have, been, who have taught that God does not kill have, um, have focused on this message as what they say is a, is a key element in understanding the character of God. Now, all of us have different ideas about this. I'm sure that even in our audience, we may not have unity on how we view this matter. I'm really asking everybody to be, um, to be all our panelists to be as kind as possible, to be as kind as possible. But of course, we, we need to express the truth as we understand it. Because, and I'm asking all the people who join us to please turn off your webcam. Please turn off your webcam. Apart from the panelists, Sister Alana, we're seeing you. If you can turn off your webcam, it would help. Yes. So, um, because I know that we have some very sincere brothers and sisters, some of some of our very good friends, who hold to this idea that God does not kill, and we want to look at what are the biblical reasons, uh, biblical reasons, and otherwise why we hold to our own conclusions. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be the, the, the moderator. I'm going to just ask questions of our panelists. I'm going to ask each one to give. The person that I address will respond to the question. And then, then if anybody else has something to add, uh, then we, we will take it as well. We don't want to be too long on each each question because we would like to, to be not too long in this in this discussion. I mean, not overly long. And then at the end, when it is all over, we'll close the panel, we'll open the room, and whoever has questions to ask, we will deal with those questions. All right? So that's how we will proceed. So um, first of all, I'm going to ask, um, and again, I want to repeat, if you're just joining the room, please turn off your camera. Please turn off your camera so we only see the panelists because of the recording, for the recording's sake. We only want a panelist on the screen for this afternoon. The brother Jim is King is still. But um, I guess I'll have to keep repeating that because we will keep joining a little later. And also remember, turn off your microphones. I hope you will all try to remember to do that. All right. So I'm going to ask Brother Nada. That's the first question to Brother Nada. And if Brother Nada can give us an overview of, in your understanding, what does the doctrine that God does not kill, what does it really teach? Okay, uh, thank you, Vid. Uh, can you hear me okay? I haven't tested my mic yet. You're sounding good. Fantastic. Uh, look, the, the idea... Nara, give me a second. Let me mute everybody. There's some little background noise that is... All right. So, yes, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, the, the idea... Uh... That, that's described as, as God doesn't kill uh, is usually not referred to that way by those who, who promote it. I have found that they, they seem to not like uh, that designation. They usually refer to it as God's character. And it's simply that God does not play any active role in uh, any death that occurs. Uh, God steps back, God uh, removes himself, and he basically lets nature take its course. Usually, uh, uh, nature that's been perverted as a result of sin and consequences and God leaves them to their own devices and what ends up happening is they simply die because of that. Now in many cases that might be the case 
but in the scripture we see that that is not the case in quite a number of cases but just as an overview uh, it's what can easily summarize and this is perhaps uh, like I said not a self-designation that they give themselves often uh, the, uh, the doctrine that God doesn't kill it's something they say well we don't call it that we call it God's character because it is seen as really the ultimate manifestation and demonstration of God's character of love is that he does not withdraw life from his creatures particularly people human beings made in his image he does not play any active part in withdrawing or recalling back life from his creatures uh, some other means nature or perverted nature uh, takes that course and this is how they die that I think that's a fairly fair summary then going to the details of each story and case uh, uh, they try and explain it to harmonize with this basic premise. Thank you, Brother Nada. Uh, just just as, a, as an extension of that question, and maybe you or anybody else can answer, but in, 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 from what you understand of this, um, uh, this idea, do they also believe that God never commands people to kill? How do they relate to that? Because if God never kills, does he does he command people to kill? Does he instruct people to do what he won't do? Would anybody like to address that question? In your understanding, what do they believe on this? This. Go ahead, brother Nada. Uh, usually, uh, Vlad wanted to say something too. Usually, by extension, exactly. If God does not carry it out, then it would be illogical and inconsistent to expect that God commands someone else to carry it out. So it's usually God does not do it. He does not instruct. He does not command. Uh, anyone else to carry it out although there is some variation because you have sometimes where people say it's uh, it's God's determination that you know this person has forfeited life but uh, he allows other means or other individuals to carry it out even like like Satan and, and, and so on so yes by extension God's consistency if he doesn't take life or withdraw life then he cannot really command others to do that otherwise he's doing it by proxy you know get someone else to do it on his behalf all right so that leads me to um another question that brings another question if this is true um uh, brother brother you, you, i'm going to ask you a question i'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the, the whole topic but um how then how then would people explain the fact that there is so much in the bible that that says that god told people to, to to kill or that he himself actually killed somebody like there are verses that say say that the lord slew ananias and sapphira that the lord um the lord killed slew uriah um slew Uzzah. i'm sorry not uriah Uzzah. so first of all before we begin to look at the doctrine itself we want to understand the the thinking behind it. So, uh, do, are you aware, or is anybody aware of how would these brothers and sisters address those kinds of questions? How would they answer those questions? And remember, so uh, I know some of you are more familiar with this than others. So, please feel free to 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 to, to make your comment. Blood of light. Uh, can you can you hear me now? I didn't test my mic, so. Hearing you. All right. So um. Uh, th this theory started here in Romania about 20 years ago, and uh, I was talking back and forth with, with uh, its promoters, and basically this theory states that, um, or at least the people here generally, they say that the resolution of the great controversy is exclusively up to the appearance of a people which will understand, they will accept, and they will preach that God under no circumstance whatsoever does not remove the life of any, uh, any of his creatures. And that, be, be, why? Because such an act is contrary to God's character and his will. And that uh, also that God will never uh, come near any of his creatures with the intention of causing any damage whatsoever. So not only removing life, but causing any damage whatsoever and why what is the the main reason it's because god is love of course but here, here are two aspects the two main aspects as i see that we need to um understand from from the very beginning first of all how can we know the nature of love because 
what I saw is that the promoters of this idea, they already have a preconceived idea about the uh, uh, about love's nature, and uh, of course, this idea is uh, the result of their education, and especially the result of the um, of the philosophy of the uh, society in which they grew. It's the modern humanistic philosophy, and so they take this preconceived idea and they impose it to the scripture. So then, uh, logically, if God is love then God cannot be like that. Why? Because I know already how, how love is. And so I take my idea about love and I put it uh, beside God. And I say, okay, if God is love, then God has to be like this, 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 and that. And so uh, we all know as well as, uh, as the promoters of this philosophy as well, that the Bible says altogether something different that, that this uh, theory uh, uh, affirms. And so uh, th this is the reason why nobody, nobody can support this theory by saying, okay, let's sit down and see what the Bible says. This is really possible because the Bible plainly says something else. Or nobody can say like, uh, let me show you what the Bible says about that. But actually, although the words are not used, Actually, each and every time when 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 I was dealing with uh, with this theory and with with the promoters, what they were actually trying to say is to show me that what the Bible says is not true. Basically, that was it. And so and so uh, th this is this is the reason why I would say that this philosophy is founded on on sophism and sentimentalism a lot because it's, it's there where, where it hits very hard on, on logical constructs, which are made out of, of statements which are not in the Bible. Even today, we have a very strong movement here in, in Romania, which promotes that. And many times people are passing me links to listen to some, some of, uh, of these presentations. And I noticed something. One verse, maybe two verses, two Bible verses in a whole talk, maybe 60 to 90 minutes long, and then a lot of philosophy, which is, which is aimed to, to demonstrate that what the Bible says is not true. And everything starts from this. Right. If you start with a preconceived idea, then you, you, you try to push it on the Bible, and the end result is really a mess. All right, th th thank you, um, Brother Vlad. You, you, you actually touched on several questions that I have uh, in mind to ask afterwards, but I'm going to ask Brother Ken to comment on, on, on this issue because you, you said that the basis of the, the, the teaching, the foundation of it, it, it's based on a false understanding of love. I wonder if Brother Ken, could you comment on that some more? A uh, false understanding of love. Is it true that? The, the 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 foundation of this idea is a false or a, or a misplaced definition of love. What would you say? Um, <clears throat> I really haven't um, had a false concept of love um, brought on to me when this doctrine is brought. So I'm I'm, I'm going to maybe steer it in a different direction. Um, <clears throat> Usually when somebody talks to me about this, they always bring up the story of Job. And uh, they bring up the story of Job and, and they like to point out how um, God uh, stepped aside and it was Satan that, that you know, um, did all the damage to Job's family and did all of the, of the mighty uh, damage with respect to wind and everything. And then, but much of the conversation in scripture centers around, well, why did God do this to you, right? And uh, they, they'll use that story to to try to say that some of the things that are recorded in Scripture um, with respect to what God did, it was really maybe what Satan did or, or, or somebody else. But um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the concept of love, even if you take that into account, it's like, OK, I'm going to step back, Satan, and I'm going to let you do all these terrible things. That, how, how do you equate that to love from the from the very. Um, concept that God does not kill that you're trying to promote, right? Um, whether whether you did it or whether you stepped aside to uh, knowing fully well 
that somebody else was going to do it. What, what's what what's the difference? Um, for for me, you know, um, there there is just too much in the Bible uh, describing um, what God said He was going to do. For example, when Jesus came down and and, and talked with Abraham and, and a whole slew of other things. But probably the biggest one for me, which is um, re recorded in uh, in Matthew, is where Jesus Himself says to His disciples, He says, "Fear not them which can kill the body." but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, singular, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I look at that and I say, you know, why, why is Jesus saying this? He's telling his disciples, don't be afraid of what men can do to you. But in, in, in that context of that text he's also saying don't be afraid of what satan can do to you right i mean i look at he's saying there's one singular person that you should have respect honor and glory to you to and that is the one that can destroy both body and soul and the only one i know if they can do that because look um angels uh, it has been recorded in scripture have killed people um men have killed people but the Bible says is that is that God is going to resurrect them. So they're going to be resurrected um, either as, as part of the first resurrection or the second resurrection. So that death is not a death of the soul. The only one, according to Jesus, that can destroy the soul is the one who created it from a from a creator standpoint. So um, for me, that's kind of kind of, you know, how I look at it. Um, mm -hmm. I think the only one who can take away created life is the one who created it. All the other killing that has gone on right is not permanent death so anyway all right thank you ken um I, I, and in a short while uh, we're going to look at that the biblical evidence but i i want to kind of set the what i would call the philosophical background first i want us to get that because the thing is i think the phone i think if we if we don't understand why people come to this conclusion we're not going to be able to address it because I mean, the philosophical foundation is the reason why people retool what the Bible says. They retool it because the, the philosophy that they first embrace makes them believe that it is overwhelming everything else. It overrides everything else. And so I, I'd like us to understand that, that philosophical background. So um, I don't know if Brother Howard or Brother Imad want to address the same question because the, 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 the fundamental idea I'm trying to get at is this. How does true love, can true love hurt the object of its love? Can true love hurt its object? Because from what I've heard us saying and from what I understand, a foundational idea behind this teaching, I would say foundational, is that true love cannot <clears throat> hurt its object. Is this true? I don't know if um, Brother Dan hasn't said anything yet, Brother Imad, Brother Howard, any of you want to weigh in on this? Okay, now you mentioned now something. Now Brother ACA, could you please turn off your camera, please? Later on, you, you can turn it on. Now that you put it that way, Vid, I'll, I'll just respond this way because I'm a parent, right? I love my children. And sometimes when, when I had to, right, I had to provide uh, pain at certain um, times of their life in order for them to understand certain things, right? Or maybe they didn't understand. And so I just had to put a deterrent in the way until they were able to understand. So it, to think that I didn't love my children um, when I sometimes had to do things that were painful to myself in their behalf uh, is uh, it's, you know, it's just not practical in our life with respect to um, the way we, we deal with one another. And, um, you know, with, a, with our understanding of death, right, and we can talk about hellfire or whatever maybe later, but in our understanding of death even, right, um, death is not pain. Death is not torture. Um, death is just um, a removal of existence. And uh, uh, I, I don't necessarily see that as, um, uh, you know, I guess if, you're, if your concept of God is that God is a torturer, right? And therefore, but thereby you think that, um, the, that death is a burning hell, then yeah, I, I suppose you, you could have the outlook that, you know, that's not God. And I think we all agree with that. But. I just wanted to throw that in. All right, thank you, Kane. Um, 
yes, maybe sorry. I can add uh, something briefly as well. Um, the, the, the one of the foundational sorry, things. You come in, no, no. Okay. What did, do you want me to speak, or you wanted to say something? Uh, okay. I just wanted to say a little bit before, but um, Brother David mentioned something about phil philosophical, not even. Okay, better now. Go ahead. Okay, let, let me just check and see what. what uh, go go um, ahead. Hmm. It's, there's, go ahead. There is a delay. But All right, we're here. Okay, we're here. We, we can't hear you. Your, your audio your audio looks like it's off, Howard. Or 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 it's too low. All right. Good. Good now. Okay. Um you mentioned earlier about the philosophical idea um about love. Now there are people, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we have all met these people who says they are Bible people, they are biblical people, and let us go based on what the Bible says. Now, this is the perspective I've had of, um, of people who believe uh, like this. The perspective is that they, uh, they say, what does the Bible say? So they, they use something that, that, is, that is legitimate, leg legitimately registered in the scripture, and say, look at this, for example, in Second Corinthians, no, Second Samuel, um, twenty-four, verse one, it talks about how that um, the Lord moved David to number Israel. When you when you get to the same story in First Chronicles twenty-one, it actually says Satan moved David to number Israel. Somebody suggesting that I speak a little slower. All right, so they say this legitimate use of showing where Satan did something and it gives God the credit is actually the truth of the scriptures. So when you therefore see the word of God as saying, giving credit to God doing, just remember the story in Samuels and Chronicles, where Satan did something and God gets the credit. Okay, um, Brother Ian, can you turn off your, your webcam, please? All right, so so um, that was a comment, Brother Howard. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how, how much of it came through. I know that we probably we're have a, a low signal. We're hearing you. You have a slight stuttering, but it's okay. All right. Um, okay. We, we, and, and we're going to look at some of those issues in a moment. But I just want to finish with the, this, this, this idea. Why do people think it is such a great doctrine? And I think Brother Imad wanted to say something. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, hi everyone. You can hear me, right? Um, yeah, it's it's the, one of the foundational things of it is that people assess um, the Bible. They assess the things that God does based on their understanding of what love is. So they say, well, God is love. The Bible says God is love. Hence, how do I think love is? Obviously, love cannot kill. Love does not hurt. So they take this principle and their understanding of what love is and they enforce that on God and on the Bible. For, just to give you an example, just so those who are watching don't think we are imposing this on what people say. From the book, uh, uh, The Assassination of God's Character, uh, it says, if things said to be commanded by the Lord, including Bible verses, that is, do not line up with the words, teaching and life example of Christ, it is not true. If it does not line up with the Ten Commandments, it is not truth. If it does not line up with the principle of love, it is not truth. 
and the problem is that according to those people they set up what the standard of love is they set up what love should look like what love should behave like and so forth and from a human perspective we think taking someone's life is not love this is the philosophy that we have and hence we take it and we enforce it on god and on the bible but the question that should be asked is is our understanding of love accurate is our uh, approach to it and what we think love would do and would not do is that accurate is that according to the word of god or not so i think this is one of the foundations uh, of this teaching my personal understanding of love is and i force god to fit in that understanding all right thank you brother imad um don you haven't said anything yet so i'm going to i'm going to throw the next question at you you can respond to it first the, it, but but it is not jesus the perfect example of love and and jesus never hurt anybody so this is an argument too that these brothers will use jesus is a perfect example of love and you cannot you cannot find a true representation of God's character until you look at Jesus, and Jesus never hurt anybody. So that in itself defines how we should understand love and how we should interpret everything else in the Bible. Um, Sister Loy, if you can turn off your webcam, it would be great. I know Andrew just left and you need his help. So we're just having the panelists on the screen. Yes, Dan. All right. Um... There is a concept among people that Jesus came here as an example to us. That's the first thing I want to look at. And that is something I disagree with. He didn't come here to be an example of how we should live. He came here so that he could give life to humanity. Not to set an example that we should look at him and say, that's how I should live. Yes, his life was, was in harmony with the will of God. And so, yes it would be good for us to look at him and try to live the way he lived as much as is possible. But without the changed nature, that's not possible either. So looking at him as an example and saying, well, he never hurt anybody. Therefore, God, this is how God is. That's one side of the coin I would look at. But I'd also want to go back to something somebody said before that um, I think there is a, a, a lack of understanding of death as we now know it, which is transition from this life. Because people think that somebody dying is such an awful thing, but then everybody dies. Even if nobody kills us, we all die anyway if God doesn't come before, if, the, if Christ doesn't come before. So we all are going to die anyway. Death is not such a horrible thing if in the plan of God, we have moved from death into life. And so sometimes, depending on the circumstances, it is, it is obvious that God sees that the best thing under the circumstance is to remove the lives of people who he himself may take to heaven at the end anyway. And, and Revelation tells us, blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth because there is a state of being better off dead than alive in certain circumstances so to think that removing somebody's life is such a is such an awful thing that god would never do i really can't see any rationale behind that all right so so your thought is that jesus the life of jesus is a good illustration of the life of God, but it's not a comprehensive illustration. In other words, there are things Jesus did or didn't do, which is life on earth did not require or did not call for. To, so, so to, um, brother, brother Nader, would you expand on that a little bit? So before Nader, Nader comes in, I just wanted to, to remind us of um, what some might consider a violent action of Christ, which was uh, whooping the money changers out of the, out of the temple. You know, so if we're looking for examples, perhaps that's something we could do in the churches, eh? Yeah, uh, look, that that's true. Christ's uh, mission, he came to earth 
to be the savior of mankind. That means the experiences he experienced on earth were not every single scenario that exists to illustrate an example of how God acts in every circumstance and every case. He came for a specific mission to be the savior of men, the restorer of life, to deal with sin, with Satan, and to be the 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 second Adam for us, the, the source of life. So when we look at the at his uh, example in his life as a savior, as a restorer, as as a healer, and people say, see, there was no any action of uh, uh, justice of uh, you know killing anyone. Therefore, God does not do any of this. So to limit the activities uh, and behavior of God to a 33 demonstration of the work of a savior on earth for a particular purpose and a mission uh, really limits the whole picture of God. And people say, oh, this is, this is, Jesus came to reveal God's character. Indeed, he did. He came to reveal God's character as a savior who is restoring us, who loves us, who were wayward and sinners, and his mission is to call us back, most definitely. So uh, we need to look at not just the example and, and, and the behavior of Jesus, but the teachings of Jesus. And Ken referred to this verse, earlier where Jesus actually in part of his teaching instructed us and this was not a scenario that that he had or experienced that we are to fear rather than fearing those who can kill the body but we are to fear rather him which is able to destroy both body and soul in the grave when, or, or or you know in the end uh, not to get caught up in hell and the definition of hell now and all of that stuff but the idea simply is this according to Jesus God the Father has the right to recall or withdraw the life that he gave not just the physical life but he says body and soul this is part of Christ's teaching on earth so Christ was not concerned with people you know misunderstanding this or misunderstanding God's character he says be careful I don't want you to think of my father you know in this way at all this was not a concern for him he actually clearly indicated even though he did not have a, a scenario or an example where this was something that he did but in his teaching, it is clear that God is the ultimate authority in the universe and he has a right and every right to recall or to withdraw the life that he gave. The, the, the second aspect to this is then if God has this right and, and it's fairly clear from what Christ said, how he does it becomes a secondary situation where people say, well, he does it by doing this or by commanding an angel or by indirectly allowing Satan or by withdrawing his presence. The how of it is secondary to the primary component of does God, does God have a right to take, to initiate an action or a decision to withdraw life from his creatures, whether by actual action on his part or inaction on his part is secondary to that uh, primary component. Okay, thank you, Brother Nada. Now, I'm going to ask all of us what, a question that I'd like us all to think about. I'm, I'm going to ask Brother Howard to comment on something in just a moment, but I want everybody to consider this question. I'd like each of you to think about giving me a one paragraph answer. What do you believe is the greatest harm, if any, in believing this doctrine, in believing and teaching this doctrine? Because ultimately, that's the bottom line, because the people who teach and promote this believe it is the greatest teaching in the bible the greatest teaching in existence because they say it is a final message that is to be given to the world and and we object to that and we i'm sure most of us have some comment to make about this but i wanted to think about giving me one a one paragraph answer no longer than one paragraph i wanted to tell me what you think is the greatest danger the greatest harm in accepting and believing this doctrine. But what I want to ask um, Brother Howard, I think both he and Don started to comment on this and maybe somebody else. And I, I didn't allow you to expand because we didn't get to this point yet. But um, how do you see this, this approach affecting the way we view the Bible? And the way we deal with the Bible, the approach that is taken in establishing this doctrine, does it affect how we view and approach the Bible? Maybe it's similar to the question I asked before, but um, I still want to hear you say it. How does it affect the way we view the Bible and the way we approach any teaching in the Bible? Brother Howard.
we may have to bypass your uh, on this Howard. All right, let me let me let me pass the question to 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 you, brother Iman. Your question mainly is how does it affect the scriptures, right? Yeah, how does it affect the way we approach understanding any doctrine? Does the approach taken in 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 the approach that these brothers and sisters take in in establishing the doctrine that God does not kill, the approach that is taken, how does it approach the way we, how does it affect the way we approach the Bible in order to understand anything? Yeah, well, it, it, try to to keep it short. I find a uh, a great similarity between the effects this doctrine has on the scriptures and the Trinity has on the scriptures. In that, when it comes to the Trinity and looking at the Bible, you cannot take it literally. You have to spiritualize its meaning. When you read Son of God, you can't take it literally. When you read Begotten, you can't take it literally. When you read the Spirit of God or Father, you can't take it literally. You have to spiritualize it. I see the same thing happening with this doctrine in that when you believe this doctrine, you cannot take the word of God literally as it reads. You have to spiritualize it and philosophize it in order to make it fit with your beliefs. You place your understanding of love, your understanding of what is right and wrong above what the scripture says. So suddenly, which I guess ties in with your question that you asked us to, to answer in one paragraph. Suddenly, uh, we are like a ship without an anchor. We don't have a, a, a higher authority that we can refer to in order to know what is right and wrong, except for my perception of what love is and what love isn't. So in short, it destroys the authority of the scriptures. It, it just gives us the license to spiritualize it and fill it, suffice it away. All right, thank you. So I think maybe I'd better move on to that um, question because I have a feeling many of the answers will center around the same point. <laughs> so let me begin with um, uh, Don, then we, uh, let me begin with Vlad, then we'll move to Brother Ken, Don, then Nada, then back to you, Brother Imad. Um, yes, Vlad, that, that question. Can you give me in one paragraph what, what you understand? Even if we give the same answer, it will be interesting to hear our different takes on it. Um, yeah, although I wanted to say something about the question that you, you had before about what we see in the life of Jesus, but if there is no time, no problem. So here's my answer. Um, this is what I, I said to these uh, brothers from the very beginning, I remember 20 years ago, and that is that the 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 biggest problem is not the theory in itself but but the biggest problem is the new approach to the scripture in other words what they say you cannot find this doctrine plainly stated in the bible but to the contrary why because like when you see for example moses saying thus said the lord kill well, you have to understand that it was not actually the Lord, it was somebody else. I won't get into that. So it's like, it's like you would have a meter and you are 10 a meter which, which is 10 centimeters short. So every time you use the meter, you have to remember to add that little piece which, which is missing from your meter. So then, if this is possible with the Bible, with respect of this doctrine, my next question is, what about the others? How can I determine, basically this is the question, how can I determine which is true and which is false? I cannot rely on the Bible and the Bible only as a means for measuring different theories, but I have to rely on my own mind and my own understanding, just like I said, and I guess Imad was saying the same thing. These people, they are coming with their theory, their picture of love, and they are pushing it into the Bible. So I guess this is the, okay. the, yeah, this, this is the biggest problem. We, we have to have a different approach. The Bible is not the standard anymore, but our own mind, our own understanding. Okay. Don? 
Okay, as you said, I think that we are going to say pretty close to the same kinds of things. But yes, I think I think this kind of approach really demolishes confidence in the Bible because you have to you have to say that maybe 70 or 80 percent of the things you read in the Bible are not depicted as they really should be because the Bible is replete with the idea that God instructed or himself carried out these actions and you have to say that none of those are true and therefore as as you're saying as Vlad said and and um and Imad I think and perhaps others when you get to that point you you cannot now call upon the Bible as an authority for your belief what it leaves you with is not just not just your own suppositions and your own ideas but it also leads leads you to know bring another source of authority and this other source of authority now takes greater preeminence than the bible and so and so the, the bible is not reliable as a true record of what god is like so we take something else that is more reliable and that's what i see it destroys your confidence in the bible all right thanks um over to you brother ken you need to unmute yourself got it so i was kind of laughing when you you said that you know that they point out that this is the last message to mankind because uh, of the paradox right um jesus was the one who said that when this gospel of the kingdom is preached unto all the world then shall the end come not does god kill and then so you can imagine right the the final message to mankind goes is god does not kill then all of a sudden the plagues come thousands of people die and then jesus appears in the heavens and everyone is destroyed by the brightness of his coming not the angels coming or anyone else but his coming so the the whole the whole thing is like god does not kill but just wait till he gets here it, it's it's really bad <laughs> all right let me ask um brother nada and brother imad are you basically going to uh say something similar No, because I want to modify the question a little bit for you, because what I want to ask the both of you to address then is this question. Uh, wouldn't you get the same kind of objection to um, those of us who talk about the new covenant? Because there are many things that are said in the old covenant. There are many things that are said in the Old Testament that I, for example, and I think many of us would interpret in a, in, in, in a completely different way today we would take some of those things and we say they didn't really mean they didn't really mean this they mean something else and and some of the things we we find in the new Te testament are actually directly contradictory to the old testament and we would say it's because of what jesus taught us it's because of what we see in the life of jesus why we how would you respond to that yes he might uh, look good, good question there is some truth to that i mean i i can't deny that there definitely is some truth to that and there definitely is some truth to the fact that god dealt differently with the people back then than he deals with us today i mean a perfect example is stoning god does not require us to stone today uh and many other examples come to mind but i, I go back to the foundation of this doctrine the foundation is god does not take life under no circumstance so yes god changes the way he deals with people because he's dealing with changing humanity and as humanity changes he adapts the he adapts the way he deals with us so he can best reach us but does god take life or not their point is under no circumstance under no, no circumstance god will take life and this does not harmonize with the scriptures so i would agree with the fact that god changed the way he deals with humanity from the way he dealt in the old testament take your sword and kill your brother to the way he deals with us today and there definitely is a difference in the way god is revealed in the old testament or rather what is highlighted of his character in the old testament and what is highlighted of the character in the life of jesus there is a difference we, we can't deny that but let us not but one against the other let us try to understand the bigger picture and that god does do this and does do that as well god is love but he's also just he's he's forgiving but he's also a judge 
he does give life but he also does take it away and under different circumstances god behaves differently so he can better reach us so the answer to your question is yes god does change the way he deals with us and there are some things in the old testament that do not apply to us today but their point is even in the old testament god did not do that which is wrong But I'm not adding anything to to share on that particular point. Uh, sure, we have we have clear we have clear reason for understanding things a certain way because we have sc scriptural support in the New Testament to help us understand. Uh, where many times things in the Old Testament were typical, were uh, illustrative. We uh, they were symbolic. We have uh, a spiritual, uh, more broader application in the New Testament with support for it. We can point to the evidence in the scripture. In this situation that's severely lacking and and the danger in addition to what the people uh, have said uh, the danger with this is it focuses it unbalances the gospel it focuses on something as the vital message of importance that not a single new testament author addressed or preached a sermon about or talked about or recorded for us anywhere the focus of the New Testament is the last message of mercy to the world. Uh, the gospel that is to be preached to all the world is this everlasting gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, salvation uh, in Christ. It is not what God doesn't do when people die. It's a totally unbalanced uh, warping of the emphasis of the scripture. And I have noticed that uh, uh, people, especially uh, promoters of this, speakers, uh, thought leaders, uh, authors of this, uh, they become almost obsessed and therefore it influences those who listen to them that this is it you know they write books about it they do a whole series on it this is all they really discuss and talk about and everything is brought to bear to, in subjection to that uh, particular idea it totally unbalances that if you take it and plug in that idea into the new testament say well how many sermons were preached about this how many authors wrote about this you will find it missing completely the emphasis in our preaching has to match the New Testament teaching and preaching and revelation. Uh, I mean, um, if I may come in here, uh, uh, the, the, our connection is not that well here, so I have to turn off the um, the webcam sometimes because the bandwidth and all of that. Um, if I'm getting the, the, the if I got the question right, um, my comment would be that the New Testament has brought a, a, a tool that helps us to properly understand and interpret the Old Testament. And the reason being, Jesus came as the full and final revelation of God's character. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that he is the expressed image of God. Am I coming across? Is everybody hearing? Right. So is the full um, and final expression of God's character. So it's the express image of God. So when you see Jesus, when you see Jesus's attitude and actions, you can understand that God's will towards us is one of well, well-meaning. It's, it's always his goodwill towards us. So based on the fact that Jesus reveals this, we take this tool, God's final revelation of himself, to interpret the rest of the scriptures. Now, most, most of, of those that, that hang to this doctrine, they use examples. And they, they go from the perspective of our understanding of love and not necessarily from the understanding that Jesus has revealed about God's love. I'm not sure if, if I got the question right and, and if even the, the comment is of any value to what you're saying. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it's, it's a part of the picture we have been... Um... We have been looking at so so what 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 if i could encapsulate all that we have been saying we are saying that um the the in order to first of all begin to even hold the, this idea in our minds we have to first of all reject the idea that the scriptures can be depended upon in terms of what it states we have to first of all come to a conclusion that the, that the bible is speaking uh there, there are elements affecting the bible like the ignorance of the writers like um like misreporting of events which lead to the bible having a consistent 
flaw that runs throughout the entire scriptures because it's not just the old covenant it's right through to jude and revelation that you have this idea that god will eventually destroy the wicked and, and that he has done this in the past he has taken life in the past so you have to reject a volume of information from the very beginning before you even start to approach the subject and um so so most of us uh see danger in this and we, and we also say that as far as the old and the new covenant uh, uh is concerned there is a definite absolute uh change in the way the bible shows god relating to people in, in both dispensations but in this case the bible itself teaches the change very clearly and explains the change very clearly so even though you might have the Old Testament saying this and the New Testament saying this, if you take the Bible as a whole, it's a very clearly explainable difference that the Bible brings to our attention. So there's a difference. And um, it's important in understanding that because you can't just say um, there's a change and because you change here, then any change is justified. The, 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 the evidence biblically that God has taken life and will take life is overwhelming. It's massive, and it's hard to it's hard to really understand how we can get an, a conclusion that um uh, to the contrary. Now, another question I want to ask is um what I what I see arising in the discussion of this subject. Is the question of the actions of a person versus the motives or the should I say intent the motives of a person right um, I don't know if any of you can pick up on what I'm trying to say I'd really like I'd really like somebody to comment on this motives versus actions are they are can, can you do something that seems to be evil while your motive is good, can the good motive justify something that outwardly appears to be bad? Who wants to comment on this? Go right ahead. I, I, I think it was mentioned earlier, right? You, you, when Jesus went through the temple and he was overturning everything and basically kicking one, everyone out of the temple, right? It, the, the appearance is that it, it looked bad. And if you don't understand the motives of what he was doing, right? To, to many of those that were around, it's like this guy's lost his mind. So um, that's that's just just one aspect, but motive is everything, right? Uh, I would like to comment something here, and sure. um, uh, I would like to to tell you about um, an event in history. But before, I'd like to ask you a question: um, How would you name? a person which in time of peace in our modern society purposefully took the life of 608 people so again it's a time of peace it's our modern society with its philosophy and purposely he took the life of 608 people well i guess all of you would call this guy a a uh, mass criminal, a uh, uh, genocidal guy, a murderer, but but the context is king, right? I'm talking about um, a guy by the name of uh, Albert Pierpont, who is um, who is uh, remembered in history as the last hangman of Great Britain. He killed 608 people during uh, 22 years. Uh, 200 of them were condemned for war crimes in Germany and Austria. So did he have a, the heart of a killer or he was just doing the job? Or well, let's suppose you're, you, you have two people in the court. One of them broke in a house and uh, kill, killed the, uh, the family. And the, the other one was working up on the roof and he just dropped the tile. And the tile just fell on the head of, of another person. Uh, both of them basically did the same thing, but are they criminals? So I guess it's uh, it's the context and the motive 
which says it all. And uh, more than that, when, when it comes to God, we have to understand that God sits in the same time in different places, meaning he has different roles. Just imagine the parent. A parent has the greatest authority while he also is the one who has the greatest influence. So in other words, he has to, he has to discipline the child in the same time he has to teach the child what true love is. So is, is there any way to meet these two responsibilities? The problem is that uh, this philosophy, it's like taking God out of the picture of the great controversy and views it in the light of the uh, modern philosophy. But it, it would be helpful to put God in the middle of this crisis, in the middle of this at least 6,000 years uh, of bloodshed and murder, and, and he has to deal with it all. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I can add uh, briefly as well. Definitely, uh, your question, uh, and thank you, Blair, what you said, and Ken, uh, definitely the motive makes a big difference. Uh, uh, it's a massive. Uh, difference. For example, if I take a knife and I cut you open with it because you upset me, that's evil. But yet a doctor can take the same knife, put you on a theater table and cut you open to, to, to remove uh, some sickness, some cancer or something out of your body. He's causing you just as much pain, just as much blood and, and so forth. But the motive is, is totally different. Hence, the way it's looked at it is different. We see the doctor, he's doing good. Now, the same thing with God. If I go and kill somebody because I hate him, well, that's murder. But when God out of mercy, and we have to always keep in mind that whatever God does, it is always the most loving thing to do, even if it doesn't come across that way. So when God in his mercy, he takes somebody out, he takes their life away, he corrects them somehow. We should always see it in light that God's behavior is always the most loving thing to do. There are many reasons I can give why God could do that. One of them is to protect the rest of the family. Back then, it was Israel from having this sin or this infection or this disease spreading. So God takes them out. He's done that many times and so forth. So to answer your question, yes, the motive makes the big difference and why uh, to explain why God does what he does. So instead of justifying the character of God by asking, did God do this and did God do that? We need to approach the scriptures and try to justify the character of God, if that's what you want to do, by asking, why did God do this? If the Bible says God did it, believe it, don't question it, but ask the question, why did he do it? and investigate in the scriptures to find out the motive behind it, which will explain a lot uh, why. All right, um, Ar Arlie, can you turn off your video? I, I see you peeping, you need to put on your glasses. <laughs> if you can turn off your video, it would be very good because we just need the pan pan panelists on the screen. Now, I'm going to also ask you you guys on the panel one question, just before I, I, I tell you a little, a little something that happened to me, but um, I'm going to ask you to, 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 to share with us one incident in the Bible, which in your opinion is the clearest evidence that God takes life, the clearest evidence that you can find in the Bible. Now, I, I, I'm going to share a, a little experience. You know, one time I had to kill a dog. Um, it's not much to kill a dog, but the thing about this is that this dog was, was an animal that lived in the same yard. It was a dog that I liked very much. It actually belonged to my neighbor. We actually lived in the same house. but um. This dog, for some reason, became crippled from the uh, 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 on the back part, from the from the waist down. The dog was crippled; couldn't move. And um, it's not it's not like 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 the developed countries in Jamaica. In Jamaica, when a dog gets sick, you 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 don't have the money to spend to take it to the vet or anything. You wait for it to die. But this dog started to suffer, and and one night I heard the dog crying all night. When, when I woke up in the morning, the dog was covered with maggots. The, the screw worm flies had, had laid eggs all over the dog, and it was covered with these maggots from all over the body. 
I, 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 it wasn't my dog. But I couldn't stand the sight, so I took something and tried to scrape off the maggots. And the dog was there, being eaten alive by these maggots, crippled. And my 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 neighbor was unable to deal with it. Maybe he has a weak stomach or something. And I eventually I went to him and I said, "Can I can I kill her for you?" And he said, "Yes, please." It's not my nature. I don't have a butcher's heart. But I went and I dug a hole. I took a hole and I dug a hole and I took the dog to the edge of the hole and I raised the hole to hit her in the back of her head. And I, she looked at me. She looked at me with, with her eyes. The dog was my friend. She trusted me. She looked at me with those eyes and I could not hit her. And eventually I took a piece of cloth and put over her eyes. And then I hit her once at the back of a base of her skull and her body shuddered and she died. And a feeling came over me that I can't explain. But I think I did the right thing. And I think I did it because of love. Even though it caused this terrible feeling, I did it because I love the dog. I mean, would it make sense for love to sit back and watch this animal eaten by maggots and die gradually over the process of days because I'm too loving to do what has to be done? This for me is one of the experience I've, experiences I have had that make me, make me think that the, the concept of love that says love cannot hurt its object is misplaced. It's misplaced. So, if anybody wants to comment further on that, please go ahead. I mean, we, 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 we have some questions, and so I don't want to go over long. But um, I did ask each person on the panel to give me your strongest biblical incident which demonstrates that God does heal you. All right? I will do that. All right. I will do that this way. Yes. I just wanted to, 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 to just say something about um, what you mentioned about the dog before I give you my strongest um, reason to believe for believing that God is not killed. The, 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 the argument is whether or not euthanasia is, is then um, something viable that we should think about. You know, the fact that somebody is suffering and is in so much pain, can we not just by mercy killing put the person to rest? But the difference with me and the person's life, see that dog doesn't have an eternal, a soul, it doesn't have a soul, have a soul. it doesn't have, there's no salvation for a dog. But for a man, the only person that is, that, that is in, the, in the place of, um, of knowing the, the true end of that, that man is the sovereign of the universe, which is God. So for God, God can remove life because he knows the reality. Slow down, I'm sorry, okay. Um, he knows the reality. So I would say God then is the only person with legal right to take life for whatever reason. Most of the lives taken in the Old Testament are, um, as, as you have shared before, lesson, lessons in this big, great parable. Nevertheless, let this go to my, my, my strongest reason for believing God takes life. One day, the Israelites found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And they went to Moses and said, we caught this man gathering sticks because it was already declared that nobody should gather sticks on the Sabbath. So they said, this man, we caught him gathering sticks. Here's what Moses said. Put him in ward and I will inquire of the Lord what is to be done unto him. And they placed the man in ward. I guess they detained him. Moses went to the Lord and Moses came back with an answer. And the answer that Moses said he got from the Lord was this, stone him until he's dead. That's my strongest point. I guess I'd go next. Lest anybody get my strongest point. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> well, my, my strongest uh, scripture reference to say God takes life is that God instructed when the, when the ark was being transported back to Israel, God said, nobody should touch the ark. 
And we know the story. They are rocked and seemed like it was going to topple over. I would think if Satan was the one who took life and God didn't, that Satan would have kept Uzzah alive to show that the ark was nothing really. But Uzzah died. So who took his life? Was, was Satan cooperating with God? Or was it God? I think that's a clear evidence that it couldn't have been anybody but but God. So that's mine. Okay. All right. All right. I'll, I'll step in here. So <clears throat> for me, um, uh, it's, it's not uh, the destruction of the world by the flood or whatever, but the biggest thing for me is the, um, the parting of the Red Sea because <clears throat> it, was, it was the avenue by which God glorified himself for the deliverance of his people. And in the deliverance of his people, he then not only not only did he let the waters fall in on them, which killed them, right? But <clears throat> they were withheld from that water by the pillar of fire, right? Which the Bible clearly says is the presence of Christ, right? They were withheld. The fire then moved out of the way to allow them to go into that water. And then that water came in upon them. And <clears throat> Moses said, very clearly that this was part of God's deliverance from them at the beginning and at the end, and they gave glory and honor to God for, for every aspect of it. So if you're going to say that God saved his people by the parting of the water, you, how can you not say that God also destroyed the Egyptians by allowing it to come back in? And of course, this is a very strong parallel with the end of time, right? The righteous, right, are delivered by the second coming of Jesus, and the wicked are destroyed by it. So um, in, 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 in like manner, um, that's probably my biggest thing is all glory to God for the deliverance of his children through the destruction of the Egyptians in the water. So, Yeah, that is one of my, my strong reasons to can because if Satan destroyed the Egyptians, then he delivered Israel. And if God delivered Israel, then he destroyed the Egyptians. You can't have it both ways. All right, who, uh, who, who will be next? Uh, I, I can. Uh, one of the clearest passages to me is uh, what Jesus said. Uh, we refer to this passage, fear not them that uh, kill the body, but are not able to destroy the soul, but him rather, which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Uh, because it's from the lips of Jesus. And uh, uh, along with in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18, uh, where those uh, creatures in heaven, uh, they uh, they give glory to God. And they say, uh, for the hour of your judgment has come, and that thou shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. Simply showing, rather using one illustration, I wanted, I wanted to use something from the New Testament and show that from the lips of Jesus and how those that inhabit heaven have no problem with seeing God as an authority that can recall again the life that he gave. So, so uh, we are, we are, we are, the, the point is we are all agreeing that when God takes a life, it is an act of love. The, the, the idea that God takes life is not contrary to love. Um, yes, Brother Imad. Okay, I guess uh, a lot of uh, the good points were mentioned already. I'll mention something that is not usually mentioned, uh, not because it's the strongest, but because it's... it's uh, makes one think i think um in acts 13 we have the story of when paul was um uh sharing the gospel and you have elamias e-l-y-m-a-s elamias the sorcerer he was persuading the the deputy and then the bible says then saul filled with the holy ghost set his eyes on that man and he told him you are going to be blind and the Bible says that he was blinded, he was taken. And as a result, the deputy, when he saw this was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So here we see Paul saying something to the man. And the man had a blindness come on him. That is, according to many people, that is evil to blind someone, right? So somebody, whether God or Satan, you decide, somebody blinded that man. But as a result of that action, the deputy ended up accepting the gospel and believing on Jesus. So you have two things. If Satan inflicted that, then Satan is working in partner with, with God. Satan's work led the man to believe on Jesus. But if it's not Satan, then it's God who did it because it's a supernatural work. 
if God did it, then you have to see that God did the most loving thing to do at that time, which in our eyes is evil, yet it worked for good. So that's an example to think, and that's in the New Testament as well. Okay, thank you very much. Did, did you share your, your incident, Brother Vlad? No, I, I guess I'm the last one. Okay, um, right. And uh, I, I want to say this. Let's suppose, let's suppose Abraham got it right. Moses uh, got it wrong. Moses got it wrong. Elijah got it. All of them got it wrong, okay? They didn't understand that it was not God, but it was Satan, or it was their own preconceived ideas because of the culture that they lived in, etc., etc. Well, at this, my simple question is, why didn't God just tell them? Why didn't he just go to Moses and say, hey, look here, it's not me. You got it all wrong. It's, it's the other guy, right? I mean, it would have been so simple. But let's suppose, let's suppose that he didn't do it because, well, you know, Moses uh, grew up in Egypt and he had uh, his mind filled with, with the Egyptian uh, uh, philosophy and religion. But here's my question. Is there a person who was completely open to any new revelation from God about God? Yes, and that person was Paul. He was very much into the Jewish religion, but then because of the revelation of, of Jesus, he was open to anything Jesus would have said. How do I know that? Because of, of his position on the law, right? And the law was on the center of Judaism. Now, right after his conversion, Paul spent three years in Arabia reconsidering by inspiration all his theology, 100% open to the new. And yet, when he starts to write about this, we found in, find in um, Corinthians 3.17, he says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. So my question is, how come that Jesus revealed him all these mistakes in his understanding about the law or new covenant, everything that we know. And he didn't say anything about this so-called unique key, which will resolve the great controversy and will produce these people, which, which will give this amazing last message that God does not kill. Jesus was silent. And so for me, this is the biggest argument because we had this person, who was a, a high theologist, he was open to a new revelation, and yet God didn't tell him nothing, nothing about it, but he, he uh, kept on going with the same picture, with the same idea that God destroys. Okay, thank you, Brother Vlad, and thank you, guys. I mean, I won't even pretend that we even... One last one, David. Yes. I just want to, because this is probably very obvious, of course, but... I think it is worth mentioning, it's the final moments of the controversy. When God resurrects people, didn't he know that Satan was going to kill them again? He resurrected people who were already dead. And then the Bible says, fire came down from God out of heaven. I mean, what is this? Satan is going to do that again there because he, he what does he hope to achieve at this point in time? But he's who also destroyed. It? He's also destroyed. So who does it? Who kills him? He kills himself. The volcano. <laughs> suicide. Right. Um, suicide at the end. Yes. So so I, I know we have we have not even begun to 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 touch upon how 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 all the implications and all the different angles we can look at this subject from. But in the interest of time, we have to stop because I want to allow people the chance to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to close the the panel at this time, and I'm going to say that if anybody wants to ask a question, you you're free to do so. We can also turn on turn on our webcams. I, I I did ask you to turn them off. You can turn on your webcams. Other people who want to do this, and um, what I'm going to ask is that if you ask a question, please address it to a particular member of the panel or even to me, the moderator, okay? Address your question to one person. The reason being that um, we could have six different responses to the one question, and that would eliminate some people from asking their questions. I, I imagine there'll be some questions. So address your question to one person in particular, 
and we will just take that answer and then move on to the next one. If we have time at the end, then we will we will we will allow other people to answer. Okay. So I see Sister Cheryl has her mic on. I don't know if that's by design. If she has a question. Yeah, I do. Um, what about the ultimate? Like, um, Jesus Christ died for us, or or if you want to say was made sin for us. Didn't God essentially kill him because he turned his back on him? Isn't wouldn't that be like the ultimate? And if they don't believe that God kills, then then there's no salvation through Jesus. I don't know. I was kind of that's what I was kind of thinking. Um, I guess to you, David. Okay, um, that, that, that's a good question. And and the truth is that there are people who say God didn't kill Jesus. They say that what God did was he did, he left him alone and Satan took the opportunity and killed him. That's that's how I've heard some of these brethren explain it. But based on our understanding of the good news our understanding of the gospel our understanding of righteousness by faith what i see very clearly is that jesus jesus died when god forsook him he says my god my god why have you forsaken me and then he died and we, we see in the garden of gethsemane those great drops of blood coming out of him god had to abandon jesus or if he didn't he never sin upon himself because when he took sin upon himself the essence of that was that god had to leave him alone god treated him as the sinner deserves to be treated as a sinner should be treated that's what it means that he bore the sins of the world and the experience killed him so god didn't put a knife through the heart of jesus god didn't smite him with a rock god put him in a situation where he was sure to die it's like i it's like i put my child where there's going to be an explosion and I leave him alone and then there's an explosion and I say I didn't kill him. You know, it's it's kind of silly to say I didn't kill him because I put him in the place of death and I left him alone. So I appreciate your question and, and your question in itself makes it obvious that in what God allowed to happen to his son, in what God did to his son, we see the principle that love sometimes has to take drastic action. It has to do something that is terrible in its consequences, but love requires it. So I agree with you, Sister Cheryl. Wayne, go ahead. Uh, okay, I was thinking of I was thinking of um, Jonah when Jonah um, was sent to Nineveh. Who was he expecting to bring an end to the city? Was he expecting Satan to bring that end, or was he expecting God to bring an end to the people of Nineveh? Um, uh, let me put it to uh, let me put it to Nadar. That's uh, thanks, Ryan. That's another good example. Uh, and 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 Jonah was angry with God be, at the end because God didn't do what he uh, was hoping would happen. Uh, most definitely, and and. Uh, as a matter of fact, that the preaching that Jonah was instructed uh, was actually not to try and convince Nineveh to repent, but that destruction was coming. The, his message from God to Nineveh was destruction is coming. Uh, and he preached that to Nineveh. He says, you're going to be destroyed. And he preached it with such vehemence that it caused them to actually repent. And of course, he was angry. So yes, a short answer. It, it was God that's who gave the uh, instruction in harmony with other prophets uh, in the Old Testament who understood the same thing. Okay, we have a question here from Brother Artie, and I think a comment as well. Okay, it's not really so much a question, but it's something for us to really think about pertaining to the God does not kill. It is... Many, many times in this New Testament scripture and even the Old Testament, we see where God declared that, that there is no greater than him. And when he make us oath or he swear, he swear to himself because there is no more higher authority than him. So he swear unto himself. So where God does not kill our concern is that if we see God in God in that light, that means God is limited. Is something that uh, Satan can do, or even men can do, but God cannot do it. God cannot kill. 
that is bigger than God. So that is just really something that uh, I can uh, see that uh, we can uh, put God, uh, we have God on a, on a limit, but he's not a sovereign God that can do every and anything. Okay, okay that, that's just what I... Okay, Brother Arthur, and as I said, the subject is bigger than we can discuss one evening. I know that the people who embrace the, the belief will, will come with an answer to that, which I won't even go into it because um, it, we, it could get really prolonged. But um, all right, thank you for that contribution. Um, I don't know who is next. I don't I have a question. It. Yes, go ahead, Cliff. Okay, my question is, all right, so I, I'm, you know, I, I get what the panel is saying about about this but you know based on what god did in israel and all the commands that he gave how do we reconcile romans 11 verse 26 um is roman 11 26 literal or is it figurative and you know if you, you know to read what it says it says and so all israel shall be saved as it is written there shall come out of zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness for Jacob. Um, so, how do we reconcile that? Would you, would you address the question to somebody in particular? Um, I'll address it to you, but you could address it to anyone who would like to answer. I, I'm nobody in particular. All right. Um, all right. Let me let me. Uh, the, the 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 verse is in Romans in that section where Paul is. He's talking about God's plan for, for Israel, but in that same passage, he first of all says that it's not everybody who is called Israel is Israel. He makes it clear that in Isaac shall your seed be called. He, he makes the point that the true Israel of God is those who are the spiritual children and not the flesh and blood children. So, so everything that he says from that point on has to be understood in that context. Now, I think your question is addressing this idea means nobody will ever be killed by God. Nobody will ever die. Nobody will ever be lost. I, I know that, I, I, I don't think this is what you believe, but I know that there are people who have come to this conclusion. Um, Dr. Lorraine Day, who is very, a very, very, very strong advocate of health and so on, has some very good stuff out there, but she, she eventually embraced this teaching that God does not kill. And she has come to the conclusion, I don't know if she changed, but this is what she was on her website. Let me mute everybody. Yes, Dr. Dr. Lorraine Day has come to the conclusion that everybody will eventually be saved, including Satan. Including Satan, because, because God is too good to kill anybody. God is too good to kill anybody. I mean, ultimately, you end up there because, because if God never kills anybody and he's almighty why doesn't he arrange for everybody to be saved because that is contrary to his character so anyway what i'm saying is so i understand cliff's question so when when paul says all israel shall be saved he doesn't mean all the jews he doesn't mean everybody who goes by the name of christian he means everybody who is in christ and that is a fact all israel shall be saved but he already makes himself clear that it is not everybody who is called Israel who is Israel. It is only the true Israel who are truly the children of God in Christ. I yes, have, um, uh, Brother Dexter. Even. Uh, I just I just had a question. I'm going to direct my question to Vlad. Uh, if if the wages of sin is death, whose whose rule is that? You know, if if God can't kill then who who could we blame for that kind of a rule well this, this uh, in the first place this is not a rule this is a natural law because uh, of course if you if you divorce somebody from life there is nothing else there but but death so it's uh, more as a consequence it's not a, a rule not even a, a, a natural law which was made, actually made up by God, but it's a natural consequence of a choice which anyone can 
can make. I, I'm not sure if this answers your question. Yes, I, I guess in the, in the context in the context that I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about the the children of Israel uh, being at Mount Sinai, you know, and then and then being uh, afraid, you know, and ask, asking to be hidden from God. We have this this like like you say like this natural law that the consequences of sin is death, and they recognize their own wretchedness to the point that they wanted to be hidden from God. But if God can't kill you, why why would anybody want to be hidden from Him? And it's a go ahead, yeah, go ahead. It's it's a complicated question because two things two things are being are are overlapping here, and one of them is how God related to people in the Old Testament and um, the true meaning behind what was happening then, because I, I understand what Brother Stephen is saying. I mean, in, in the context of the Old Testament, here's how you understand that rule. You transgress and you are sentenced to die. You transgress and you are sentenced to die. You pick up sticks on the Sabbath, and God sentences you, sentence you to die. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebel against Moses, and the, the God opens the ground, and the ground swallows them up. So, in the context of the Old Covenant, yes, the wages of sin, the sentence, the legal judicial sentence is that you die, and somebody makes that sentence, and that person is God. So, in this context, um, Brother Stephen, your, your question, I would say yes, but on a greater level, I would say that this, what happened in the Old Covenant was God trying to illustrate what Vlad calls natural law. Ultimately, who destroys the sinner? Ultimately, in that broader sense of destruction, who destroys the sinner? Ultimately, everybody charts his own course where you choose the way of sin. If you choose the way of sin, then ultimately you will die. And whether or not God takes your life, you are going to die. Because sin is the agent of death. So on that broader level, yes, the natural law is you sin, you die. But God did set up a system where he said that if you transgress the law, he will take your life. So that in itself, as you are, you are pointing out, that in itself demonstrates clearly that God does remove life. Because he made that system, he made that rule, and he carried out the specifications of that law. Well, David. Yes. I want someone, probably you, to tell me what happened in the Garden of Eden. Why did God remove the tree of life from the Garden of Eden? This is Brother Peter. Yes, it is. Right, and, and I think that's another good example. I mean, I know I know it's a simple simple question with a simple answer, but um, yeah, obviously, um, God said. He, lest man should put forth his hand and take the tree, the tree and live forever. God deliberately in the Garden of Eden established a, a system, set things in place to remove man from the opportunity of living forever. So I suppose people would say, well, he never took their life. He only put them in a situation where they would die. And it comes back to the question that was raised earlier on. If you, if you are not involved in the thing, but you arrange for it to happen, it's like you, you, you put, a, put out a contract on somebody. You get somebody to do the job, but you don't do it. And then you say, I'm innocent. I'm not involved. I mean, it's, it's not a, really a pretty picture to paint of God who will get somebody to do his dirty work, but he won't do it himself, if I may put it that way. Yes, Nara? Uh, there is a good biblical example for that, the, the story of David, who uh, arranged for Uriah the Hittite to be killed. And uh, he had nothing to do with it. He stayed in his palace. But when Nathan came and rebuked David, he, uh, as far as God was concerned, he says, you killed Uriah with the sword of the Amorites. A very clear example that talks to this case, uh, biblically, how God views things. So by the same judgment, we should look at God and we can say, well, God arranged for it. Even the, the laws of nature that people say, well, just consequences happen and nature takes its course and these people die. God has nothing to do with it. Who set up these laws and rules of nature to operate this way? Ultimately, the final responsibility in the universe is God. We can't take that away from him. We're actually det detracting from him. Uh, he has that right. So that's just a biblical example to that particular point. 
Brother David? Yes, um, go ahead. Um, I've actually run into this kind of thought, not even among Christians per se, but just people in the world. And I think um, one of the examples that comes to mind more prominently that I've run into is uh, in the gay community, for example. I've had people I know that have said to me, if God is love, then he loves me and he created me and, you know, he made me just the way I am. And so God would never destroy me. I mean, they even take on the banner of a rainbow, which hints at God's promise not to destroy the earth again. And so I think of Sodom and Gomorrah and how Abraham was, you know, kind of bartering back and forth with God about um, if there's only 50 people, 40 people, you know, 20 people. And then God ultimately hurries some angels in to get Lot and as many as would go with them out. Um, but I think that there's this this feeling now in society. I mean, yes, it's spilling into our churches, but even in the world where God is a loving God and so anything goes and there's no consequence and that God will not take action. And I think I've heard many people at least that I've come in contact with who are non-Christian who has this this philosophy that God is so loving that he would never kill. Hmm. Could I ask who this is? Pardon me? I'm just wondering who, who is speaking. Oh, this is Dee. I'm from Maine. Oh, hi Dee. Good to, good to meet you. Yes. <laughs> nice um, to meet you too, brother. The, the, there is a word that we use in relation to God, and it is the word sovereign. Sovereign. I mean, generally speaking, it means the one who is king. When we apply it to God, it means a little bit more. It means that God is ultimately responsible and ultimately capable. The, the, the person who is responsible for the, the security and the ultimate well-being of the universe is God, nobody else. When evil, when sin arises, it is God's responsibility right. to bring it to an end. Yeah. When, when, sad. when, I mean, whatever process he goes through, he is the final in that, in that, word on, 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 on what happens in the universe. So the, to paint a picture of a God who is so good that he cannot fix the problem, what they say is that what, what, what our brothers and sisters say is that God sits back and allows nature to take, it, take its course and then nature will eventually destroy those who, who, who don't accept God. As Brother Nada pointed out, who designed nature this way? I mean, whichever corner you go to, you end up with God. If God designed nature this way, then God is the one responsible. Whether he designs nature to operate this way or he actively intervenes himself, which the Bible says that he does. The bottom line is God is sovereign. He's responsible. If the king is too weak to do what needs to be done, then the king would need to be replaced. And that's straight, simple talking. If the king cannot do what needs to be done, he needs to be replaced. God is not only a God of love. He's a God who is strong. Strong. He's strong enough that he's able to override sentiment and do what has to be done. He will, he will weep tears when the wicked are destroyed. Some people don't realize that God will cry when Satan is destroyed. Do you think that God hates this being that, that, that he created to be his son? Do you think that when your son goes bad, you start hating him? If he even becomes a mass murderer, and you have to sentence him to die one day and even pull the switch. You love him still and you are crying. Your heart is bleeding, but you have to be Amen. strong enough. You have to be strong enough to do what needs to be done. And God Amen. is not only a loving God. God is a strong person. That's why we admire him and we can trust him to do what is right. Amen. And that's why it's called a strange act on his part, because that isn't something that he does lightly. Yes. Exactly. Question for Ema. Okay, wait, wait, you can uh, you can stop the recording. Thank you. I think I should do that. I have a question for the 